General Motors is presenting this series of programs to broaden an appreciation of our Constitution in the belief that the strength of America lies in understanding our freedoms and responsibilities as citizens. If there's something wrong with this law, if it infringes on my rights as a human being, then by all means the Constitution is going to provide a way for me to do something about that. I had no doubt about that in my mind. And he told me, uh, uh, as I left, he said, the world is made up of managers and martyrs, and you, Professor Hockfield, are about to become a martyr. Well, I guess the Supreme Court su uh, proved him wrong. After the Supreme Court decision, and I said to myself, what have I done? The torrent of abuse, the penalty, shall we say, of being a... An instigator. In this report, some Americans who stood up for privacy, conscience, and freedom of religion in a constitution for the people. It is 200 years old. One country, one constitution, one destiny. We have revered and debated it. Like the Bible, it ought to be read again and the again. The people made the Constitution, and the people can unmake it. We have honored and criticized it. My faith in the Constitution is whole. It is complete. The prejudices of the day are called constitutional law. We even fought a bloody civil war over this it. This covenant with death, this agreement with hell, this refuge of lies. But we have lived with it. We are still living with it today, still debating it, still in search of the Constitution. Here in the National Archives are the three most important documents we Americans live by. The Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Constitution. The Declaration announced America's determination to be a free and independent nation. The Constitution established our government, and the Bill of Rights guaranteed the protection of individual liberties. We believe in democracy, in majority rule, but we also believe in limits to democracy. There are certain things the majority ought not to do, even though it's democratically elected. The Bill of Rights spells out those limits. The Bill of Rights is for you and me, but only when we dare to make it work. Have you read these? You ever read that before? Congress will make no laws representing establishment of religion. That's good. Did you ever read these? Do they sound familiar to you? Tell me if you've heard those before. Let me look, give you one of these and look, look at it for me. Look at each one of them. Okay. Read, what are those? You recognize them? Yeah, it's from the Constitution. What part of the Constitution? Oh, uh, I don't know about that. Can you read this? Congress shall make no law respecting or establishment of religion. Or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. You know what those are from? Bill of Rights. Yeah, sir. Well, now, these are these are Bill of Rights. Good for you. A lot of people think they're in the Constitution, but they're not. They're in the Bill of Rights. Do you, this is the Bill of Rights. You know what they do? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Bill of I know what they do. I'm offended to say it. Yeah. 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 What are the Bill of Rights, you know? Ah, uh, the survey. Um, it's not the Ten Commandments. What do you, have you heard of the Bill of Rights before? Yeah. What does it do? It gives people the, the rights of America. What do you think they're for? Do you remember from school? Oh, what you live by is mostly what you're like, you well, know, code of conduct, you might say. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do they use the Bill of Rights for? They use it to, to buy things in stores. They use it to be allowed to live in certain places and to, to be able to walk around in the United States. To be free? Yes. I see. They establish the rights and freedoms that you have as a citizen of the United States. It's the guarantees for every American citizen. What kind of guarantees? Everything that you can think of. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, so on. Who's it for? It's for everybody. 
Every American citizen. Who is it for? It's actually for minorities, for people that uh, uh, are not necessarily in agreement with the majority of the people. So the Bill of Rights protects us from? It, it protects us from, uh, well, it, from oppression, from uh, a dictatorship. And that's, the, that's the main force of the Bill of Rights. Who's it for, the Bill of Rights? It's for the people. It's for us. What, what, what does this do for us? I think it gives, it gives us a lot of protection against... Oh, they protect us from, our, from ourselves, from, from tyranny. Uh, Bill of Rights. Jesus, this is embarrassing. Uh, I don't know, Bill. Do you think people today are, are familiar with these, or, or do we take them for granted? No, I think we take them very much for granted, far too much. Do you think we take them for granted today? I think we do. I think a lot of people do who haven't had exposure to what's going on in other countries. Well, most people aren't, I don't think, ever in situations where they really push comes to shove. I mean, if you are, you, you wouldn't take it for granted. Have you ever had to exercise it? Have I ever had to exercise it? Sure, I exercise it every day. In what way? Well, in my ability to speak about any issue that I want to. Uh, that's freedom of speech. Uh, I think it affects every, every part of our lives. Do you feel pretty good about the Bill of Rights today? Uh, yes, I do. What about for her generation? Um, well, I think there's, I mean, this is from what I see on the media. There seems to be movements in, in um, either religious or political uh, areas where, where people want to try to change them or amend them or use their own interpretation of the rights in their own way. I think our founding fathers were pretty intelligent in, in what they did in establishing the Bill of Rights. Uh, I think in a lot of ways they were ahead of their time. And I think the Bill of Rights as they stand and the basic interpretation should be the way it should be dealt with. I think the new interpretations that seem to be coming out with different religious leaders, maybe different politicians, whatever, I think they might be threatening the Bill of Rights. Do you feel those rights are in pretty good shape today? Mm, most of them are. Where are they not? Well, I think uh, some of the freedoms of speech are being threatened in, what in way? certain areas. Uh, well, I think that maybe uh, religion is kind of infringing in the, uh, the freedom of speech with the, uh, the PACs and things where they're, they're really influencing the government. The religion is trying to influence government instead yeah. of the other way around. Right. If someone tried to force you, some government agency tried to force you to pray, would you go to court? Well, of course. Of course I would. Uh, that's that's my right to do it or not do it, as I see fit. Would you go to court if you had to pray in school? Yes. 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 Why? Because some people aren't religious. What? Because some people aren't religious. And what does that mean? And that means that it wouldn't be fair for them to have to pray in school if they didn't need to. That's what church is for. You shouldn't have to. That's what church is for. A generation ago, it was commonly accepted that children should pray in our public schools. But then a few citizens who believed their rights were being violated took their case to the Supreme Court. I remember the prayer to this day. I could recite it at the drop of a hat. Sure, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee. Daniel Roth was just a kid in 1958 when his father Lawrence filed suit in his behalf. And I can't remember too many words. It was something. only supposed to be 22 words. No, our parents, our teachers, and our... Country? Country. Amen. That's what it was. Something. And I remember it. And I, I do remember... Uh, actually, now that you mention it, I do remember um, being terribly uh, self-conscious about not saying it. I hadn't... That's true. I, I, uh, I felt terribly... Uh, awkward you know like you when you go to a dance and you, you're convinced you're the only one with the two left feet I mean that's how I felt I felt like everybody else is saying this and I'm not why not why aren't I saying it and do I want to say it and why don't the I Supreme say Court it? ruled in 1962 that school prayer was unconstitutional a controversy erupted that continues today and the politicians led the attack this was not the first tragic decision 
or the Supreme Court. But I would say it was the most tragic decision in the history of the United States. They put the Negroes in the schools. Now they put God out of the schools. The Supreme Court decision has dealt a blow to all believers in a supreme being and has given aid to the disciples and followers of atheism by whatever name they see fit to call themselves. And, uh, what? Right this year, Lawrence Roth and Daniel returned to their old home on Long Island to recall what happened in those tumultuous days. There's a lot of memories in this house. Yeah, it feels kind of funny being yeah. here. It Doesn't really it? Does. Yeah. But, uh, well, I guess what was it? 12 years old when we moved here, and I guess I lived here until I went away to college. So yeah, it felt like There's a lot of six years. A lot of living in this house, and uh, some of it somewhat painful, but I guess that goes with the territory. But it, it looks nice. This is um, this is where the rags were put down yeah. rags the night that the cross was burned. Here. As long as a year after the court's decision, the Roths were still besieged by people angered at their suit. A cross of burning rags scarred their driveway and their memory. And if it hadn't been for my neighbor, John, who knows what would have happened. We might have all gone up and smoked because the, the It was right behind the, the rags, car. Yeah, well, but the, but the gasoline-soaked rags were going right up to the gas tank of my car, which could have gone up like that. I remember turning the corner over uh, there and seeing uh, uh, fire uh, yeah. engines and oh, yeah, cars and, and... Fire engines and, came. And many people out in the street and it was really quite a shock. Memories. Yeah. It is uh, important for us, if we're going to maintain our constitutional principle, that we uh, support uh, Supreme Court decisions, even when we may not agree with them. In addition, we have, in this case, a very easy remedy, and that is to pray ourselves. It's been 25 years now since the Supreme Court handed down that decision. Do you still remember the day you heard the news? And suddenly, one day, it ended and it began, shall we say. It ended. Well, the case ended, but it was the beginning of, let's say, the widespread notoriety, for lack of a better word. It was only when the, when the Supreme Court decision came down and then, then the thing uh, really exploded into... What happened? Oh. <laughs> what happened? Well, we began to get mail, for one thing. Several thousand pieces of mail, well over 2,000, something under three. We began to get threats on the telephone. Don't start your car tomorrow morning, it's gonna blow up. Uh, we began to get, uh, well, uh, those kids uh, burnt a cross on our lawn. In fact, there, there were other incidents also. Um, oh, as yeah. I remember, picketing. the house was picketed by what was then called the American Nationalist Party. A cousin of the Nazi party. Yeah, right. It was pretty scary. because <laughs> That's the understatement of the day. You know, the, the volume of it, the, it wasn't just one or two. I mean, our names and addresses and phone numbers oh, appeared yes. in a syndicated newspaper column right. um, as an obvious shot. I mean, the, the, whoever wrote the column had a serious bone to pick with us and did us the favor of printing names, addresses, and phone number. Mm. And I don't know how many columns, the, the, I don't know how, what the extent of the syndication was, but it was national. And quite literally, f uh, the phone did not stop ringing for 20, 24 hours a day for, I don't know, it seemed a like a couple time. of days, if yeah. not a week. It was always been a very simple situation. Does the state have a right to mandate prayer? Now, this doesn't mean that I'm against prayer, let's say, or any of us were. As a matter of fact, I pray every day. I have my prayers right here. You do? It, I'm not against prayer. I pray all the time. Do you take a different one of those prayers every day? Oh, yes, sir. And these are prayers that I'm connected to. Uh, like, here's a prayer that I use to help me stop drinking alcohol. Uh, Read it for me. Oh, dear God, thank you for the strength you have given me 
so that I have stopped drinking the insidious poison called alcohol. Alcohol disconnects me from my heritage, my inner voice of Ezra. Blessed is your name. And uh, what was it Justice Black said in the decision on your case? The prayer of each man must come from his soul and must be his and his alone. That's the genius uh -huh. of the First Amendment? Uh -huh. And that's exactly my position. That this is such a personal matter, such a private matter, one's relationship to the creative process is not something that can be thrown down on a bunch of unwilling or unsuspecting or unknowing children. It distorts, at least in my view, distorts the, the meaning of the creative process of which we are a part. Why did you suddenly decide in the case of your sons to take the stand? Once they said to pray, you could only pray in the Regents' Prayer, which was written or sponsored by the Board of Regents. It was an official prayer. Oh, official, absolutely. This is the only prayer that could be said. Do you remember the prayer? Yes. Even to this I moment? I remember it absolutely, as well as I remember the Pledge of Allegiance. What was it? Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee, and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Amen. What did you think when you prayed that every day? Well, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't say anything. I remained silent. Did any kids uh, say anything to you about not praying? Truthfully, I have a, st a stronger recollection of teachers um, ostracizing me more than my fellow classmates. Two teachers in particular who managed to um, hold me up for ridicule and, and questioned uh, uh, my patriotism, if you will, and, and implied that uh, what we were doing was some kind of communist-inspired plot or words to that effect. The teacher. Yeah, absolutely. In absolutely. front of the other students? Yes, absolutely. Several times, more than once. Suggested that you were unpatriotic? Oh, yeah, absolutely. To the other children? Oh, in, in, in my civics class, what we called CE, citizenship education. What did you think when you heard that? It was tough. I mean, it, didn't, it did not make adolescence any easier, I can tell you that. <laughs> what did you think, all this hate in the name of religion? all of this abuse because you'd simply done what an American citizen is supposed to do, defend his rights? I was unprepared for it. There is just no way I could have imagined that what seemed to me to be such a clear-cut, clean issue, one that, that our founding fathers fought and one that went on in England for umpteen generations, the fight with the separation of church and state. It seems like such a clean cut issue. It just never occurred to me ever that it would be misinterpreted to be an attack on religion in general or prayer in general. It's, you know, it's ironic because um, it's obviously very much alive today. This is anything but a dead issue. The fact that the Supreme Court has ruled on it has only fanned the fires to some extent. Here's why you had the reaction. For so long, nobody challenged that. Mm -hmm. The prayers were said week after week, year after year, decade after decade, until finally Lawrence Roth and a group of his neighbors out on Long Island decided to challenge that constitution. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you were taking on the religious establishment of America. I mean, do you remember what uh, Cardinal Spellman said when the court handed down his decision? He was shocked and frightened. It strikes at the very heart of America's godly tradition. Cardinal McIntyre of Los Angeles said it was shocking and scandalizing and would force America to emulate Khrushchev. A Methodist bishop in Georgia said it was like taking a star and stripe out of the American flag. Supposing the local Hare Krishnas decided that they, that they were in power and the Christian fundamentalists had to say their prayer. I mean, that, that's not what this country was founded on. If the Harry Christians dictated a prayer to Jerry Falwell, 
I'm not so sure that he wouldn't have done exactly what my father did. And thank God there's a mechanism in this country that allows for that kind of redress. So, you know, it's a very dicey thing when everybody gets on a high horse and says, well, how could people object to prayer? If it was somebody else's prayer that they had to say, I bet they wouldn't feel so generous. If that majority wanted a prayer and exempted you from having to pray in it, would that change it? The country was founded on the premise of religious freedom. And the consti this is a constitutional issue. And it has been become so exacerbated because, it, because religion, not, the Constitution is not an emotional issue. Religion is an emotional issue. And that's fine. I have no arguments with that at all. But that's not what this is about. This is about the Constitution and what this country is founded on. Millions of people in this country right now, including the President of the United States, want their prayers back. Are they going to get them? I have the feeling that there will be a long, drawn-out struggle, shall we say, a political struggle from on every level of political life to determine this issue. I could see my children's children's children going on with this issue because uh, it's not something that's going to be, I think, decided overnight. Daniel, would you, you have how many children? Two children. How old are they? My son will be 15 tomorrow and my daughter is nine. Would you put them through the same process in defense of your strong beliefs about the Constitution? Well, before I could even answer that, I'd have to wonder if I'd put myself through it, frankly. Um, that would really be a harder question for me to answer, to be perfectly candid. I'm not sure I would want to do it myself. If I decided to do it, then yeah, the answer to your question would be yes. I would, I would hope to uh, impart that conviction to my children, but the first question is whether I would do it. Do you know the answer to that question? Um, not really. Um, I'd like to think I know it. I'd like to think I would, but I'm really not sure. I'm honestly not sure. What would you tell him about that, Mr. Roth? Were there moments when your own faith wavered, when you weren't sure you had done the right thing, uh, this persecution, these slings and arrows? That is the question, whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. Yeah, I read that. The only time I felt I had qualms, I felt somewhat ambivalent, was after the Supreme Court decision. And I said to myself, what have I done? The torrent of abuse, the penalty, shall we say, of being a, an instigator for lack of a better term, the penalty of oh, possibly exposing my children to danger. And that was the only time that I had, that I wavered uh, somewhat. And uh, I don't know how else to describe it, that, that there are just certain things a man's got to do. What does it feel like to have the weight and power of the Constitution on your side while so much of the country is on the other side? Well, when I think about it, it gives a certain amount of security. I feel that I'm connected to this past. Meaning being part of the, being part of the founding of the Constitution, the making of this nation, not to mention a longer history. Yes, not to mention that which went on in England for a long time. What's the lesson in this for the rest of us? The lesson for me, and hopefully for the American people, that you can fight City Hall should the need arise. Would you go to court if somebody tried to make you pray against your will? Yes, I would. Would you go to court if you had to? I certainly All the would. way to the Supreme Court? Yes, I would. If you had to pray against your will? If I had to pray, I certainly would.
What if you had to sign a loyalty oath? If you had to sign something you didn't believe, would you go to court? Yes. Yeah. 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 Why? Because it's not fair. It's blackmailing. If they what? make you, if they make you sign it, it's blackmailing. They can't force you to say they don't believe it without a fair trial. Don't want to sign it. There were few fair trials for the accused in the McCarthy hysteria of the 1950s. I have not, never have been a communist. I am not, and never have been a fellow traveler. I am not, and never have been a supporter of a member of or a sympathizer with any organization known to me to be or suspected by me of being controlled or dominated by communists. The junior senator from Wisconsin, Joseph McCarthy, used public hearings to attack the loyalty of government officials and private citizens he said were communists or communist sympathizers. You're not fooling anyone. I have offered to go before any committee, do anything you ask. If I can just get you to come down here and take the oath so we can get the answers to some questions. Loyalty oaths were still an issue in universities in the early 1960s. Where they existed, the choice was clear. Either sign the oath or lose your job. In 1964, five professors at the State University of New York in Buffalo refused to sign and file suit to challenge the constitutionality of the oath. George Hockfield and Harry Keishian, two young members of the English department, were among them. For Harry Keishian, it was revenge on the 50s. I had been in college and from 50 to 54 and at Queens College in New York. And a number of my professors had been, in fact, fired under the terms of the Feinberg Law um, and the House on American Activities Committee's sweeps and so forth. And they were people I admired very much. And what struck me at the time, what I still carried as a kind of burden into the 60s, was a sense of frustration and impotence to watch these very decent, these um, intellectually talented and dedicated teachers vanishing from the system, uh, being driven out. Uh, and not being able to do anything about it. So a decade later, when there we were at the University of Buffalo, there was an opportunity to do something about it. Do, do you remember what the oath said? Oh, i glad you asked. I happen <laughs> to have my um, certificate right here. This is the one you were supposed to sign. Right. Yellowing but unsigned. It is see. unsigned. Yeah. Is this the original one presented yeah, to you? That, that's it. You've kept it all these years? Oh, yes. I just read it. I guess. All right. Anyone who is a member of the Communist Party or of any organization that advocates the violent overthrow of the government of the United States or of the state of New York or any political division thereof cannot be employed by the state university. Anyone who was previously a member of the Communist Party or of any organization that advocates the violent overthrow of the government of the United States or the state of New York or any political subdivision thereof is directed to confer with the president before signing this certificate. So this is the actual requirement. That, now, why do you object to that? Why did you object to that? Well, it presented a political test. That is, one had to um, declare oneself to, uh, to, to have passed a, political, a test of political purity. Uh, yes, this... it was, in effect, a, a test of conformity. And from, from our point of view, I, I think, insofar as academic freedom was concerned, that was the key. Um, the, the issue of academic freedom comes up when you see the uh, certificate as a political test of conformity, uh, if, as a requirement for, the, uh, for, for entrance into the teaching profession. How many members of the faculty were there at the university at this time? There were 900. And how many refused to sign? Five uh, altogether refused to sign. 895 signed? I'm afraid so. The uh, implication of not signing was that you would uh, lose your job. So um, when people thought about it, and they thought about the possible costs to them, because it was um, one of the things that one heard was, if one wants to fight this, it's going to cost a lot of money. And so the people who fight it will have to put up money. Uh, although with considerations like that in mind, um, a lot of faculty simply decided it wasn't worth the trouble wasn't worth the danger. The faculties of the medical school and the law school, in particular, as I understand it, signed 
without complaint. Is that true? They did, yes. The I law d- school. Oh, yes. The future the interpreters school. of the oh, Constitution. Yes, I know. Of the First Amendment. Yeah, I, one of my uh, favorite documents that I keep around the house is a report from the law school, which assured the faculty that there was absolutely no chance that this case could be won in the courts, that the Feinberg Law was solid. Uh, I take it out every so often just to demonstrate to myself the folly of uh, my... Uh, of, well, of course, the, uh, the Supreme Court had ruled on the Feinberg Law in 1952, and they found it constitutional. They upheld it. Oh, yes. So that uh, the uh, case that we were bringing didn't... And, well, there was reason to think that it wasn't very hopeful. What was the hardest thing in all this? For me, it wasn't uh, any of these administrators or colleagues or anything of that sort. It really was my family um, and my mother and father specifically trying to... Uh, make them understand what was going on. They were both Armenian immigrants who'd uh, come to the country. Uh, they'd been in the 19... They'd suffered in 1915 through all that. And my father was a very patriotic individual, a, a rug wholesaler, and my mother was a very pious uh, evangelical Protestant, and uh, they were both really... Um, they, it was very difficult for me to try to get them to understand what this was about. I had a very touching letter, which was really heartbreaking, from my father at one point when I was in Buffalo, saying that he hoped I would never do anything that would harm this wonderful country that had given him so much and to which he was so grateful. And um, all the rest of it one could handle. What did he think, or do you know what he thought, when the decision came down from the court and you had won? Well, he was glad I won. I mean, <laughs> at least I won. <laughs> What was the significance of that to you, that it only was declared unconstitutional by one solitary vote? I worried in that I thought perhaps that would make it vulnerable the next time around or to some other sort of challenge. But I think uh, William Brennan, who wrote the decision, his decisions have apparently been uh, so well-drawn and so uh, so well-crafted uh, that they've held up in uh, very hostile environments in that court, and I, I hope they, they'll continue to do so. One of his sentences in that opinion rang out like a bell. Academic freedom is a special concern to the First Amendment, he said. It does not tolerate laws that cast a pall of orthodoxy over the classroom. Right. From the point of view of that decision, we, we won a lot. Uh, from the point of view of establishing academic freedom as a real, a solid, legal uh, thing that had to be, that could be defended in the courts, that was just, it was only 10 years before that that academic freedom was first mentioned by the Supreme Court. So uh, by the time that the language like this was used in our decision, well, one felt really we had made a great deal of progress. The court used it, you use it, academic freedom is such an abstract word, also it's almost a cliché. Now, what is it to you? What was at stake in this? Well, I'll tell you what it means to me. It means that when I teach my class, I never have to have second thoughts about whether I I ought to say something or ought not to say something. That is, second thoughts related to the possible political implications. When I uh, I discuss uh, pieces of writing with my class, I never have to think of the possible political dangers that might arise from my discussion of certain documents with them or from the attitudes that I express or the ideas that I that I uh, uh, let them hear Uh, one simply feels that one is free to do one's job as well as one can you know and not have to think about possible dangers arising from it If we don't get that across, if we don't teach our students and through them the wider community that that is vital um, and as vital as the the blood in their veins, then we're not doing our job. You said in something you wrote back then, I read before we met, uh, something about we owe it to the community to be the best possible university that we can for their sake. There's no other way. I mean, the stifling bureaucracies in other countries uh, over there, um, you know, one sees it. Uh, Why the lesson isn't learned over here, I don't know. Sometimes I think some of these people who came after us from the community would have made great communists. They would have been (laughs) wonderful communists. They had the mentality down pat. You said at the time that you just didn't think the state had the right to inquire into my political beliefs, your political beliefs. But often when a case goes to the Supreme Court, aren't there two rights in conflict? Your right to teach, in this case, academic freedom, as you say, but the state's right to preserve itself. 
Justice Clark, I think it was, who wrote a dissenting opinion at the time, said the state has a right to preserve itself, and that's what's at issue here. Although the state has a right under certain circumstances, one wants to keep those rights, that right as circumscribed as possible. Uh, if I'm actually laying plots to overthrow the United States government, well, let them arrest me. But let them not come to ask me beforehand whether I'm a member of this group or that group. That's what I object to. Of course, if I'm doing something criminal, I, uh, I, I ought to be arrested. I won't, uh, interf I won't uh, protest uh, they're doing that. You were doing something criminal. You were refusing to sign that affidavit. Well, I was convinced, however, that I was not criminal and that I would be vindicated by the uh, Constitution, and I was. And a lot of civil rights uh, marchers were uh, doing just exactly that sort of thing, that is, contravening the law of the land in the name of something which they felt to be a higher and uh, more significant moral truth. Were you disappointed that so many others didn't stand with you? Yes. I, I wanted, among other things, for the academic community to show its strength. That is to say, we uh, are not just uh, purveyors of knowledge, but we have a kind of moral strength that underlies the, the, the job uh, of being in that position of university professor, of teacher, and so forth. And if we, if we couldn't stand behind our own beliefs, especially since our colleagues had no use for these oaths, could not defend them intellectually, um, if we had stood 900 to nothing against this oath, it would have been, it wouldn't even gone to the court, I suspect. We had a marvelous opportunity to say no. And it was a bitter disappointment that uh, so few of us did. What's the lesson of that, that, that freedom usually depends upon the one or two or the few who will stand. Well, I guess it often does, uh, and I suppose in this case it did. Uh, and uh, the vindication was very sweet. And it's been sweet ever since. You know, one feels good about it for the rest of one's life. But um, it still is a disappointment that, uh, that there weren't more. If there were more, we would have all been safe. The state could never have fired 50 or 100 professors at once. Never. But it could have fired five, and it did fire Harry. Do you remember the day you heard the news that you had won? Oh, yes. Um, I got a call from a friend uh, who happened to work at the Times, and I was asleep, so he woke me up. Um, and so I, I awakened to discover we'd won. That was very nice. What about you? I heard it on the radio, and I think it was in the morning. And um, I dashed out and got a copy of the New York Times, and there was the whole decision all over a page. And I remember going to the department office, which was then in that little temporary building, you remember, on the old campus, and dancing down the hall <laughs> as I saw my colleagues who knew precisely why I was dancing. <laughs> so few of us get a chance to express dramatically our civic faith. We can vote, we can write our congressman, occasionally get a letter published to the editor of the newspaper maybe, maybe get on television once or twice to speak out. Is there some satisfaction in knowing that you might have blown this and you didn't? Oh, yes. Oh, I just, uh, the very thought that I might have walked away from this just uh, really horrifies me. It's, uh, it's sweet. It's, uh, they say revenge is sweet. If this is, uh, this is a form of revenge on the 50s, maybe, um, it was awfully sweet. I thought that the Bill of Rights was superbly vindicated in this case, and that uh, its appropriateness to uh, unforeseen conditions of modern life had been demonstrated. But what about the case that others have made to me that the Supreme Court only comes riding to the rescue of the aggrieved at the end of the siege, that in, the, in 52, at the height of the paranoia and the suspicion, the hatred and the vilification, the court upheld yes. these laws. Yes, it did. And it was only when the furies had been spent and the passions had been tamed and the times had changed that the Supreme Court said, okay, Bill of Rights applies. It was popular to do so at that time. Well, it's hard for me to hold that against the court. But I don't know of any other country that has an instrument so effective, finally, to make the law uh, prevail. And um, I think, after all, uh, with all its defects, it's something to be immensely grateful for. What's remarkable about the Constitution is that it tends to 
uh, even if we're thoughtless about it as a civilization, it tends to pull us back to certain standards. It's as if it's a, the magnet from which we won't stray too far. And to me, one of the remarkable things about that document is that the words do mean something, and they do carry resonance in society. Um, in the Nixon years, it did, and obviously crucial times in our history and so forth, and other times as well. Uh, we may stray, as with the internment of the Japanese in World War II and so forth, we may stray, but there's a home to which we return. It says something, doesn't it, that the framers in Philadelphia 200 year, years ago had you two in mind? One is grateful to them. <laughs> what if the police intruded in your bedroom? Would you go to court? Yes, I would. Do what if, as actually happened in a case I've covered, what if the police knock on the door and, uh, and uh, come into your bedroom? What would you do? Just if they just barged right in? I'll find out why they're there. I would feel that would be an infringement. You might go to court over there. Possibly. Breaking into your bedroom is only one possibility. I mean, if you let that go by, you could do anything, really. I mean, if you're willing to accept it, it may happen. So I think that's what they're doing. Privacy in the bedroom was the issue in 1986 when the Supreme Court decided a case involving homosexuality in Georgia. What is at stake here is the general question of how sweeping a power government has to control the intimate details of every life in every bedroom in this country. The issue in this case is whether or not there is a fundamental right under the Constitution to engage in this conduct, which is protected by the Constitution and from governmental interference. And that is the crust of this case. The crux of this case is whether or not that right exists. The court upheld the Georgia law making sodomy a crime. Gay communities responded angrily. Police estimate the crowd at a thousand strong, noisy, and angry. This is an asinine decision, and it's an idiotic decision. And more than that, it threatens everyone's rights. They are incensed at Justice O'Connor for voting to uphold Georgia's sodomy law in a Supreme Court ruling two weeks ago. I just cried. I just couldn't believe that um, in this day and age I would make a decision that would turn me into a uh, second-class citizen in the country that I've been raised in. It was very bad, huh? Michael Hardwick was living in Atlanta when the case began in 1982. Because he made no effort to conceal his homosexuality, he was known to police there as a practicing gay. He said this made him a target for harassment. He and a companion were in Hardwick's bedroom early one morning when a policeman arrived to serve a summons and came into the room unannounced. When he came into my bedroom, the door was partially opened, and he pushed it open. I saw the door open. I looked up, but I didn't see him, and felt... 35 seconds went by, and I looked up again, and all of a sudden there was a police officer standing in my bedroom door. In uniform? In uniform. And I came up with a very logical question, what are you doing in my bedroom? And he said that I was under arrest. And for? I asked him for sodomy. Did anybody ever tell you when you were there that sodomy was a crime in Georgia? Mm, no. Was from why I didn't even understand what sodomy was. You didn't? No. Nobody had ever explained to you? No read the dictionary to you? No, or the law. Do you think that if the other person in bed with you had been a woman when that policeman showed up, that you would have been arrested? No, probably it would have been a knock on the door and excuse me, Mr. Hardwick, type of a situation. But because of what it was, um, he kind of took it and ran with it. The policeman? Yeah. They, when they brought me to jail, they, um, made sure that they told everyone in the holding cells that I was in there for sodomy and that I should be able to find what I was looking for in there. There was somebody to get me out of jail in an hour, and it took 12 hours for them to get me out. And in the meantime, they were changing me from floor to floor, telling different um, guards in the, in the jail that I was in there for sodomy, and then they would in turn tell whoever they were putting me in the holding cells with. They told me that um, they were going to have fun with me, and the. Uh, the pit. Who told you that? The guards. They said that they were going to put me in the pit, which is where they put people that are there detoxifying them. You know, people who are really, really drunk. And they put them in there until they sober up enough to deal with them. And they were talking about putting me in there and how much fun that was going to be. And 
Every place that they put me, every cell they put me in, they, they had to tell the people that they were putting me in their way that I was in there for sodomy and stuff. It was a nightmare. What did the other prisoners do? They harassed me a lot. Verbally? Verbally and physically, you know, pushing me around and stuff. But fortunately, I wasn't raped or anything like that. Did any of the guards tell you? Did any lawyer tell you? Did any of the inmates tell you what sodomy was? By then, I had a pretty good idea of what it was, you know. By then, I definitely knew. I mean, I'd, I had heard of sodomy before, but I always thought of sodomy as something like along the lines of bestiality or something, you know, and an archaic law. I didn't realize that in this day and age, you know, that there was laws against oral sex. Why did you decide to take this case to the Supreme Court? Mm, because um, the whole experience itself was a nightmare. And when I finally digested the whole situation, which took several days, um, a committee had, re had reached me and asked me if I would be interested in doing a, team a test of lawyers case. Yeah. From, uh... from Atlanta, independent. And um, so they asked me just to think about it. And they, I asked them what was involved and, you know, what risks I'd be taking. And my mother was there. And they told them that I was taking a chance of going to jail for 20 years if the judge decided to make a, an example of me. Did you talk to your mother about it? Yeah. What did she say? She said um, that she would be dead before she saw me outside of bars again if this thing went the wrong way. And did I had she to. Want, did she want you to become a test case? No, she didn't. No, she was no. afraid that you'd lose and. No, she just heard the 20 years and that's all that stuck in her head. And then after we talked about it, well, about two days went by and I called her and I said that I had decided to be a test case and. She said that she knew I was going to do it anyway. So after that, she was very supportive. The state rarely enforced this law. It was so seldom that anybody was arrested or taken to court on it. There's an average of 10 arrests a month just in Atlanta. There on is? Sodomy under, the, under the sodomy charge? Most of them are um, prostitution and um, public sex acts. But there is about 10 arrests a month on the cause. And the thing is that as long as the law is on the books, a law enforcement authority can come into your room and say, this is the law on the books. And even though we don't normally enforce it, if the law is on the books, they can enforce it whenever they choose. You could cede the right of the state, the right of the court, the right of the Constitution to be concerned about acts in public. Right. But you're talking about something. I don't want to see sexual acts in public myself. I don't want to see. You know, a man and a woman, a man and a man, a woman and a woman. I don't want to see them having sex. You know, I don't think that people should be able to have sex. But in the privacy of your own bedroom, in your own house, I think you should be able to do whatever you want. You know? There's no other victim. There's no other victim. Society is not offended except when there is a majority that finds, for religious reasons or other reasons, what you are doing uh, an assault on its sensibilities. Yes, but don't they understand that I'm not trying to assault their sensibilities? I'm simply trying to fulfill my purpose. I'm simply saying, leave me alone to live my life the way I feel I need to, to fulfill myself. That's all I'm asking. I'm not trying to offend anyone. So, you, Mr. Tribe, you're a lawyer, and you, before the court didn't talk about homosexuality, he talked about privacy. Right, right privacy. because that was the issue. It had nothing to do with homosexuality. The law on the books, the way that it's stated, is any sexual organ to anal or sexual organ to oral or anal sex is sodomy, period. It doesn't say homosexual, heterosexual, whether you're married, not married, a woman in the privacy of her own house with her husband having oral sex is committing a felony punishable to 20 years by the Georgia statute, and it's still on the books as that. The court tried to pass it off as a homosexual issue and direct it towards homosexuality because they always start with a minority. But the fact is that if they read the law, the law has nothing to do with homosexuals. It has to do with sodomy, and it has to do with privacy. And that's the issue. Michael, you say that your behavior your conduct in the bedroom is a private matter. Nobody should care because you're not affecting the public good. But what, how does AIDS change that? Because it's now being said that 
AIDS is a plague. It's triggered by homosexual conduct. And there is a public interest. The state has a legitimate concern for the public safety, and therefore it is concerned about what happens in private between two adults. This law, this decision, this issue has nothing to do with the spread of AIDS because that is up to the individual. And that's in heterosexual or homosexual communities, it doesn't matter. It's time everyone get wise to what the disease is and that there is a plague and that there is ways of going around it. You know, you don't have to like totally stop having sex and go into celibacy. You simply have to be careful and you simply have to know what is known about the disease. Unfortunately, there's not enough known about the disease yet. But I think it's time everybody pay attention to what is known and take responsibility. Justice Byron White wrote the majority opinion for the court and he said the law is constantly based on notions of morality. And if all laws representing essentially moral choice are to be invalidated under the Constitution, the courts will be very busy indeed. The question arises, was homosexuality a choice you made? Yeah, it was. I've been heterosexual and am now currently homosexual. And um, the reason for that is simply because that is my needs. A need? You don't consider it an immoral act? No, it's not an immoral act. For me to love anyone else is not an immoral act. I mean, if I'm in the privacy of my own bedroom with a consenting adult, which is what the case was, and we choose to, like, physically relate to each other, even if it's just touching, it doesn't matter what we're doing. It's nobody else's business. And as far as the morality goes, my morality says it's fine. But the majority, you see, was saying not that we're telling you what you can or cannot do. We're only saying that we cannot find in the Constitution the right to sodomy and therefore the state has the right to regulate or not to regulate it depending on each state they weren't saying you can't do this only that we can't find a right to it in the constitution in fact one of the things the court said was we're not in the business of creating rights not found in the constitution i disagree i disagree i 100 percent believe that this government the system the constitution the federal courts, the Supreme Court, are all here to protect my rights as an individual. And I believe that the Constitution does protect my rights to, as an individual and the right to be left alone. I'm intrigued by one of the statements in Justice Powell's concurring opinion in which he said that if you had been sentenced under this law, and you could have gotten up to 20 years under Georgia law, he might have another might take another look at it because he thinks that might constitute cruel and unusual punishment, which is forbidden. Right. But putting case. me in jail for 12 hours and not allowing me to get out and introducing me to everyone for being in there for sodomy is not cruel and unusual punishment. Right. Would you I tell him that it is? I would tell him that it was. In fact, I would even go into detail if he chose to of exactly how cruel it was and is. What does it say to you that the Constitution can come down to a, to a single vote among nine justices? Um, I think it's a, a great system. I really do, even still. Despite, what's happened, Despite what happened? Despite the fact that you lost? Yeah. I know that the system works. And when I set out to do this, I never necessarily thought I was going to go to the Supreme Court. And I definitely didn't think I was going to lose at the Supreme Court, but I always had in the back of my mind that what I was setting out to do was to try to change the law, not necessarily to change it, though, even if I could just lay a foundation for future change. And I think that that has definitely been done. So when the preamble of the Constitution says, we the people, it includes Michael Hardwick. It sure does. Even though the it court just said... Does. And it still does. I am the people, you know, I am part of the people. We often forget that democracy is not the gift of the gods. It is hard won by men and women who stand up and say, enough, we have our rights too. The philosopher George Santayana once described such people as rabid apostles of liberty who want freedom for themselves to be just so. 
They're not always right. They don't always win. And they're not always likable. They break the China and rattle the cages of conformity. But what would America be without them? They keep the high and mighty on their toes and the majority on notice. They breathe life into the Constitution and bring us back to fundamentals. Freedom of the press, even for those who don't own the paper. Freedom of speech, even for those without a microphone. Freedom for religion, even for those whose God is not our own. And freedom of assembly, even for the party of one. They remind us above all that Judge Learned Hand was right. Liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. I'm Bill Moyers. What's remarkable about the Constitution is that it tends to pull us back to certain standards. It's as if it's a, the magnet from which we won't stray too far. I believe that the Constitution does protect my rights as an individual and the right to be left alone. The state has no right to mandate prayer. The state has no right to do that, and the Constitution is on my side. It was a lesson in the value of uh, being brave. Even if you didn't feel very brave, uh, still, it did take some courage. That has stuck with me ever since. General Motors is presenting this series of programs to broaden an appreciation of our Constitution in the belief that the strength of America lies in understanding our freedoms and responsibilities as citizens.